We're here to increase our collective understanding of how great cities are shaped. We believe everyone has a role to play in urban design. This is a space where we can learn from international examples and discuss issues relating to built form, the distinctiveness of cities and how we feel connected to place. We can be curious and open-minded. We can all learn and grow. So, let's get to it, Geelong. Um, welcome to our sixth instalment um, of the, in the Designing Geelong webinar series. My name is Jonathan Daly. I'm the manager of Urban Design and Heritage in the City of Greater Geelong and City Design Champion. Designing Geelong is an educational webinar series to help us demystify how cities are designed. And it's brought to you by Revitalising Central Geelong, a partnership uh, between the city and the Victorian government, delivering a 10 year programme to realise the incredible potential of this city. Geelong is undergoing significant changes and we want the whole community to be better able to engage in the process of shaping our city. So the format of the webinar, as always, is two 10 minute presentations by our guest speakers, followed by a 30 minute Q&A. Um, so feel free to post questions in the chat um, during the talks. Um, this is an educational webinar series, so we will focus on those questions that really help us improve our understanding of urban design. Uh, just to let everyone know, this session um, is being recorded. Um, Today's topic um, is why cities should be for everyone. Uh, this really is um, a big topic. Um, it includes people with physical mental impairments, age, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, homelessness, um, and, and many other topics. So today we will be taking, um, well, uh, because of that breadth, it's, it's really, it's impossible to cover properly um, all of um, those aspects in a, in a single webinar. In fact, we could probably do a, a series um, on its own in this um, topic. Um, but today we're going to take um, a broader look at inclusive public spaces and then delve into some um, of the sp specific challenges on gender equity. Um, but please feel free to broaden the discussion again in the Q&A um, after the presentations. Okay, so we introduce um, our first speaker today, who is Dr. Kurt Iveson. Uh, Kurt is an Associate Professor of Urban Geography at the University of Sydney. His research explores the relationship between cities and citizenship with a particular focus on the pub public life um, and public spaces of cities. Kurt's the author of um, several books, including Publics and the City, and co-author of Planning and Diversity in the City and everyday equalities, making multicultures in settler colonial cities. He's also a regular commentator on the politics of public space. Um, you can uh, read some of his writing in the, the conversation, or you can um, listen to him on the radio show, Radio FBI, um, where he talks about urban environmental politics on a show called Down to Earth. Um, over to you, Kurt. All right, thanks, Jonathan. Uh Hi, everybody, and um, particular thanks to Karina for that welcome um, to country. Um, and it's nice to be joining you from up here in Sydney. I'm on the land here of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I also want to uh, pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging um, from the Gadigal um, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander folks that are um, in the workshop with us today. So, um, Cities for all, yep, I've been um, researching public spaces and thinking about exclusion and inclusion in public spaces um, for a while now, since the 1990s. And I got into that originally actually having spent a bunch of years as a youth worker in the inner west of Sydney here, working especially um, in places like Marrickville with young people from non-English speaking backgrounds who were trying to contest their exclusion from public space by police, by private security guards and shopping malls and that kind of thing. Um, and so over like a few years now, I've ended up doing studies about a whole range of different uh, conflicts over public space from stuff about young people hanging out and surveillance and policing through to beat cruising and graffiti and protest and safe spaces for women and children and informal economic activities on the streets and uh, more recently about public transport as public spaces. Um, and so the little talk I'm going to do today is drawing on some work I did with um, 
another academic called Setha Lowe, who also does stuff about public spaces, but for her, it's in America. And I guess a couple of years ago, we thought we'd try and think about what general principles or what general lessons are emerging from the different studies that we've been doing about making public spaces more inclusionary and for everyone and anyone. Um, and what we ended up doing was coming up with five justice principles, um, each of which kind of respond to the different forms of injustice that we were observing in the cities where we did our studies. Uh, and each of which is, you know, about the kinds of justice demands and interventions that are going to be hopefully useful in overcoming those forms of injustice. So I'm going to list them now and then talk about them. But basically, um, there's distributive justice, recognition, justice about interaction and encounter, care and repair, and then procedural justice. So that all sounds complicated. It's not actually super complicated. I think a lot of this stuff will be familiar to people probably already, but I think it's actually hopefully a useful job for me to just try and say a little bit about what each of them are in the hope that really those kinds of concepts can be like useful for whether you're a citizen or whether you're a planner or whether you're a policymaker, that that's the kind of concept that you can have in your back pocket when you're involved in thinking about changing your own locality. Um, and, you know, obviously, like um, you all know Geelong, I don't know Geelong, uh, and in a lot of ways, it's just a, it's a dialogue that we can have about whether these principles are going to be applicable or translatable into different contexts. Um, and that's the whole thing, right? Turning these principles into practice is always the trick. So um, let me just whip through them quickly with a few little examples along the way, and we'll see if they're useful to you. So the first kind of uh, justice principle when we're thinking about public spaces for everyone is distributive justice. So this principle is about the distribution of public spaces across our cities and about the distribution of income across our urban populations. So it's a pretty classic definition of public space for everybody. And the basic justice principle here is that public spaces ought to be evenly distributed across our urban environments and populations. And people should be able to access those public spaces regardless of their income and their wealth. And I think this distributive justice principle is like especially relevant these days. Um, there's a lot of pressure on development and redevelopment in our cities, certainly around me here in Sydney, there's lots going on. And that pressure on development can often squeeze out those public spaces that are sort of non-commodified uh, and trying to make way for, uh, you know, apartments and housing or other things that are going to be able to make money for somebody. Um, and increasingly, uh, local and state governments are also doing um, deals with private actors to try and fund the upkeep and the maintenance of public space. So, uh, for instance, we're seeing a lot more things up in Sydney here, like uh, open air cinemas or festivals where people will be literally big chunks of public spaces are closed off for commercial activities. Uh, fees are charged for entry and that can kind of lock up the public spaces just for those who have the capacity to pay. So that's our first principle, distributive justice. So the second one that we can add and layer onto that is a principle that we call recognition. Um, and look, having a public space that is close by and that's free to use is not going to make cities available to everybody if the way that that public space is designed or regulated excludes some people um, or, uh, you know, either deliberately or inadvertently keeping some people out because of who they are uh, or what they do. So there's a kind of injustice that we experience in cities that's about the devaluation or the stigmatization of some people's needs and identities. So for instance, in my research uh, and activism here on the accessibility of public transport as a public space in Sydney, um, yes, public transport needs to be close and it needs to be frequent, but it doesn't matter how close or how frequent it is if people can't access the train station platform because it doesn't have a lift or if people don't feel safe in some of those spaces at night. So the basic justice principle here then with recognition is that no group should be unfairly excluded from public spaces by designs or by regulations that treat some folks as like normal uh, while treating other groups of people as being out of place. Um, and this is a really complex thing to try and enact. And I know Nikki will talk a little bit about it too, because we all belong to more than one group. 
So, you know, recognition of the needs and values of different groups is always going to be a complicated thing that is more than just a kind of tick box exercise. Now, the third justice principle in that work that I've done with Sessa is about interactional justice. Um, and it's closely related to the first two that I've talked about. So as well as designs um, and regulations that can privilege some people at the expense of others, we can also observe often in public spaces forms of interaction that can also exclude some people. Uh, most obviously, we could think here about racist or sexist or homophobic abuse, harassment or violence as uh, obvious examples of interactional injustice. So it's sort of obvious, I guess, to state, but worth stating that the quality of the interactions in public spaces makes a huge difference to making them genuinely uh, available for everyone. So yes, this is partly a matter of ethics and civility that is all of our responsibility, but it's absolutely a matter of planning and policy as well. Designs and policies can work to foster this kind of interactional justice where we don't have that kind of abuse um, and harassment. Um, and, you know, we could all probably have a think about some public spaces that just seem to foster that kind of atmosphere, right? So there's a, a sociologist, African-American sociologist in the States called Elijah Anderson, who talks about there being almost a kind of cosmopolitan canopy over some spaces where they just seem to work as spaces that are safe for everyone without hostility, without prejudice. Um, and, you know, there are things that we can do to encourage those kinds of atmospheres. So again, in some of my work on public transport, even just simple things like buses having posters up saying that this bus is for everyone and racism won't be tolerated can sort of send messages to passengers that um, there's expectations about uh, accessibility that we all have responsibility for. So that's three down, distribution, recognition, interaction. So let's think about number four, which is about care. Um, and really, again, it flows from the last thing I was talking about. Um, one of the things we can also do to make public spaces uh, available for everyone is to think about the quality and the provision of care in public space. And this can work in two ways. Firstly, um, some of us need the care of others in order to access public space. So we could think here about people with mobility difficulties, we could think about uh, small kids, you know, and uh, so the quality of care that's provided to different groups of people in our society will make the difference between whether they can access public spaces or not. Uh, but also we could think about the care of the environment and the maintenance of public spaces. Um, and again, this is not all about policing, right? In fact, I think a lot of that care in our public spaces comes from people who aren't police. Again, if we just think about public transport spaces as an example, Think about the role that guards on trains or conductors on trams or attendants on platforms or even stall holders uh, and uh, people that run like little cafes or takeaways on a train station platform or buskers at a station entrance. They don't play a policing function but can play a caring function as kind of public characters in public space that are just looking out for other people uh, and making sure everything's sort of going okay. It's such important work in our public spaces but often really undervalued. Uh, and finally, the last justice principle is about procedural justice. And this is pretty simple, which is um, that, you know, public spaces ought to be democratically governed as well. And everybody should have a, uh, opportunities to be involved in decision making about public spaces. Um, and it's fairly self-explanatory on one level, but actually always really complicated in urban environments because um, there's a tendency to equate procedural justice with involvement of the locals or the local community. And of course, public spaces aren't just for locals. Um, we all lead mobile lives and working through these mobilities and thinking about users beyond just the people who are like sleeping in proximity to a public space is really important. And again, if we think about train stations as one pretty obvious example, um, the users of a train station are not just locals. They're also people coming from other places uh, to access the you know, place through the train. So, there you go, there's five principles that are hopefully useful. Uh, and I'll just close by making three super quick points about how we can use them. Um, firstly, you can sort of see that all those things are kind of related to one another. They all pull out different dimensions of injustice and justice. Um, secondly, though, that doesn't mean that it's easy to put them all together at the same time. Um, uh, and nor does it mean that even if we can put those principles into practice that everything is still gonna be perfect, obviously, Injustice in cities is also a product of housing markets and job markets and the health system and many other things beyond public spaces. 
And uh, finally, I guess, as much as we can think about these principles being important, um, you know, translating them into practice, as I said at the start, is always the trick. Um, and I guess the way I think that we have to work here is to start by an investigation of the spaces that we're particularly interested in, looking at the particular kinds of injustice that are existing there, and then thinking about which of those principles might be relevant in addressing them. So um, I've probably gone over 10 minutes. Apologies if I have, but that's it from me. Thank you, Kurt. Um, I think you're just about on time. Um, I might, um, just while Nikki's getting um, set up, um, I might just ask um, a question. Um, it's probably a big question. So um, wh whatever response you can give us would be, would be much appreciated. But um, I think, you know, with include, you know, the provision of inclusive public spaces, local governments are, are, are really challenged by an expectation that, um, you know, we, we need to please everyone and we need to please everyone all of the time. And um, uh, I think what this tends to to produce is um, is a very sanitized form of public space that that really um, what we end up doing is trying to offend no one, and um, I think in doing that we we end up we um, we we constrain um, a lot of, sort of different practices different people have and 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 limit um, certain people from um, being in public space and expressing themselves the way that um, they 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 would naturally like to. Just wonder what your thoughts are on how we how do we move beyond that? Yeah, like it's such a great question um, because I guess the place for me, if and it's easy for me to say, maybe the place to start is that if we are going to make our cities fairer uh, and overcome the injustices that are in our cities, um, then not everyone will be happy about that because some people benefit from the injustices that exist, right? That's why they're hard to overcome. That's one of the reasons why they're hard to come, overcome anyway. Um, but your point about like the pressure on local government to keep everybody happy. So a few years ago, I was doing some work actually with the city of Sydney up here about their street art and graffiti policies. And it was one really good example. We're trying to think about how to, I guess, make the city fairer uh, and think about the place of graffiti and street art in the city. And one of the things that uh, the planners um, sort of told us was that, you know, and that we had observed in our research was that oftentimes uh, it only took in a neighborhood one person to object to a piece of street art and graffiti for the council to send in the removal crews uh, and get rid of it. Even when maybe there are lots of people in the community that, that missed it when it was gone and actually kind of loved it. but that just the, the local government folks just felt this obligation that as soon as there was a formal complaint that the way to address the complaint was to, you know, remove something that might cause controversy. Um, and so we did a lot of work with the council trying to figure out, well, what's a better process for not creating the expectation that if you complain about something, it'll be dealt with in the way that you're happy about. If you complain about something, yes, it kicks in a process, uh, a process of negotiation and dialogue, but that doesn't mean that you'll be happy at the end of that process. Um, uh, so I think as much as anything, we were just trying to work with the, uh, the city there to think um, if the process is tight and if there's procedural justice, to use the principles I was just going back to before, uh, and the council can demonstrate that there's justice in the procedure, uh, then effectively it can sort of inoculate you against some of those vexatious complaints that you might get uh, when you're trying to implement something like a street art policy because you can say well listen it's not like we've just randomly told you to get lost and we don't respect you or your complaint but we've worked through a process and the outcome of the process is what it is um, so uh, yeah and also, I guess we had to do a lot of work with residents about the expectation that there might be things in their urban environment that they didn't like as a consequence of these policies that we were bringing in. But again, to be able to just work with people slowly outside of the controversial moment to say, here are the reasons why these changes are coming in and here's how they respond to what we're hearing from residents in the city. Um, again, could just set up some expectations that then meant that people didn't expect that everything that they saw around them would be something that they would love, um, but mm -hmm. they understood maybe why it was there. And again, that all sounds really easy in principle. I know it's again, hard in practice, but <laughs> it's one kind of answer to your question at least. It is very interesting. The idea of putting justice into the process is, is, um, is one uh, to ponder. Um, thank you, Kirk. We, we'll, we'll come back to you again later in the discussion. Um, but I'd like to now welcome uh, Dr. Nikki Cams. Um, Nikki is Associate Professor in the Faculty of Art and Design and Architecture at Monash University. 
and um, the founding director of uh, the Monash University um, XYX um, Lab, which leads national and international research in gender and place. Um, the innovation of Mickey's research is in the examination of digital, um, experiential, political and material interventions, um, all brought together um, to articulate both the, the shared and conflicted struggles of women and, and girls um, internationally. Her work uh, repositions design as a strategic tool for challenging gender inequity. And her recent research has focused um, on public transport spaces for women and girls, um, gender sensitive um, septet or crime prevention through environmental design and the use of participatory um, co-design to challenge gender neutral urban policy. Uh, welcome, Nikki. Thanks, Jonathan, and thanks, Kurt. Um, just before I start, I'm just going to check that these slides are rolling. Is that yep. working? Great, excellent. So, um, yeah, thank you, and um, thanks for the invitation to present today. And I too would also like to acknowledge the Wadawurrung people who are the traditional custodians of the land that I'm presenting from today. And wherever we are, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect and acknowledgement to any Indigenous Australians who are present in this meeting and webinar today. So um, very briefly, the XYX lab, as Jonathan mentioned, um, is a research lab based at Monash University. And our research really looks very particularly at the relationship between public space and gender. And increasingly thinking about gender also means that we must um, increasingly think about the various intersections with other forms of minoritisation, which I'll touch on today. The team of the XYX lab are a group of designers, architects, urban researchers, communication designers, and we often work um, with gender specialists and social scientists, with cultural theorists and criminologists and activists. Um, and we're really expanded by a strong PhD cohort. I'd like to um, just very quickly acknowledge Dr. Gillian Mathewson, who's a senior research fellow in the lab, who really um, helped collaborate on this presentation that I'm delivering today. So I guess what I'm gonna speak about today is really guided by some principles of practice um, from the XYX lab, which is really around gender sensitive placemaking. It's about the research and work that we do advocating for women and gender diverse people and the LGBTIQ plus community. Um, as an academic, a key kind of principle is that we're very keen to make sure that we share knowledge. Um, we use a lot of co-design methodology um, and I'll touch on that today. Uh, and also this idea of thinking about how design is no longer about just objects and um, kind of putting buildings into the world, but really how we think about design as a transformative practice that's deeply related to purpose and problem solving. And so the question that we're kind of asking today is why cities should be for everybody. And I think with the research that we do at the XYX Lab, what we aim to ensure is that women and gender diverse people and all those minoritised groups within that um, have equal access to public spaces and that their access isn't compromised, particularly by their gender. Equal access means that being a part of all the things that our cities and towns and communities offer. So when we're thinking about access, we're thinking about education and training and employment. We're thinking about health and social services. Um, and access to leisure opportunities. And all of this, of course, promotes the social and economic inclusion of women and girls in particular, which is kind of the focus of my most recent research. But this also means access to many ways that public amenities can kind of change um, and engage us. So we have to think about the complex combination of individuals' access to public spaces, how we might equitably share the collective resource that's available in public spaces, and really, this is an economic development issue as well as a human rights issue. So then I'm kind of much more interested in why cities aren't for everybody. And I think that um, today what I want to kind of think about is the relationship between women and girls and gender diverse people and their exclusion. And Kurt has touched on this too or talked about this as well. But I really want to say that the kind of exclusion um, and the discussion of that, this isn't something new that we're kind of inventing. Um, we've, women and, and feminist scholars have been talking, researching and documenting women's exclusion, particularly from public space, public transport for uh, decades, centuries. And we really need to start to think how women's experience and gender diverse people's experience of public spaces is significantly different to men's. So um, to kind of jump to the kind of end of the story, if you like, 
the kinds of things that we think about and we're researching in the XYX lab is how women, uh, women's experiences is dominated by sexual harassment and really interesting ideas around perceptions of space and safety, which we can maybe talk about in the discussion. And the real and significant risks that women are facing when they're um, kind of out in the world. I'm going to step through this diagram, which kind of looks hideous and, and awful, but hopefully I'll be able to make sense of it um, and make it useful. But I do need to say that, you know, I'm saying the, the, the words women and girls a lot, and I just want to be very, very clear that um, they're kind of limiting um, terms, but often they're useful in the work that we do with policy and especially internationally, women and girls is a kind of important term. But when I say that, I am speaking about um, all people who identify as women, including trans women. And I just want to recognise that these kinds of um, uh, identities are very complex and they certainly don't capture the diversity of experiences and interests and perspectives of particular communities. Uh, and just to acknowledge the limitations. And I also just want to um, touch on the fact that when I'm talking about sexual violence or gender-based violence, I'm talking about physical things that we would all be aware of, like sexual assault, et cetera, but I'm also talking about non-physical things like stalking and kind of other forms of harassment that happen in the world. Um, yes. So part of what I think we need to understand is that we live in a world that is gendered because of gender inequality and gender bias. And gender bias arises from particular forms of prejudice actions or thoughts based on the perception that quite simply women are not equal to men. And so gender inequality is a legal and social and cultural situation where gender determines different rights and, and the dignity for men and for women. So there are many consequences of living in the gendered world, but the main ones are the ways that it impacts access and inclusion. Um, and again, I'm interested in that, how that plays out for women, but we could also think about gender diverse people and people from LGBTI communities and other minoritized people. And the particular ways that it does play out in public space is that there's a lot of gender-based violence and there's gender bias in the built environment. So it's worth noting that there's a kind of feedback back mechanism here. So the violence and the environment also produce and reinforce particular forms of gender inequality. In the built environment context, this leads to places where women's needs and interests are not met. Um, and this has a really powerful effect on how women and girls understand their place in the world. And in addition, this leads to the subtle and not so subtle messages that women and gender diverse people, and we'll talk about the extension of that into um, other forms of minoritized people, how they don't actually feel like they belong in public spaces. And so this actually is so fascinating because then we start to see how women have to become very vigilant in public spaces and they're always kind of modifying their behaviours um, and they don't use them perhaps as much as they would want to. Um, they often feel ill at ease and on guard when they're in public spaces. And all this reinforces the social and economic inequalities, which among other things lead to women's lack of agency in influencing public spaces. Um, and they're kind of, it's a kind of ongoing um, cycle. Importantly, um, current access and inclusion and belonging is unevenly distributed across society. So although the notions of public space suggest inclusivity, after all, we kind of agree that public means everybody, in practice, they can be very excluding. So this is because how we experience public space and how we're treated there is profoundly shaped by who we are and by our identity. So things like not just gender, but ethnicity and race and ability and religion and sexuality and indigeneity and age, these all are kind of complex combinations that often result in even further discrimination, which means that some are excluded from public space or indeed what we see particularly with the groups that we research is that they exclude themselves from public space because of the really crappy bad experiences that they have there. So um, I want to touch on this kind of idea of gender neutral design um, and, and the way I, I position this as a kind of myth. So often what has happened, and probably since the 1990s, um, maybe Kirk can kind of speak to this too, there's been this kind of regulation of public space that has really seen a dominance in this idea of a neutral framework. So this is where we start to see public spaces as uninformed by these kinds of factors of, of class and age and ability and sexuality, et cetera. And this is viewed as good practice. Um, this idea that uh, approaches 
that are gender neutral somehow are inclusive of everybody and therefore we kind of do this kind of um, uh, gender neutrality and therefore somehow that means that everybody can find a place in a space. And actually, when we look at this at the XYX lab and think very carefully about things like crime prevention um, and inclusive placemaking, what we discover is we're just kind of always deferring to this kind of generic masculinity, which is kind of what the gender neutral then kind of gives us. So what we start to see is that because urban planning and design practice as a profession and maybe even in its the way designers and planners are educated is a kind of lack of intersectional awareness we just kind of see that there's an exasperation, exacerbation of um, the design field really kind of just um, deferring to a default user. And that default user is just basically replicating and reproducing dominant stereotypes. And so we get places that are made for white, cis, hetero, male, able-bodied and English speaking people. Um, and so therefore this neutral approach actively kind of discriminates and really doesn't acknowledge the critical obstacles that um, many people face when they're accessing public and, and urban environments. So this is just such a huge thing that governments and organisations and institutions um, who are, you know, necessarily have to demonstrate their engagement with diversity and inclusion, they really need to think very carefully about what this gender neutral kind of approach leads to. And I just want to give you this one example, um, which we constantly come back to because it's kind of hilarious and terrifying, where um, a landscape architect in Australia was kind of in a team meeting and criticised by one of the female team members saying that he hadn't designed the public park that um, took any consideration for women into account. And he responded that he would just paint one of the basketball courts pink and that that was his way of managing kind of um, dealing with uh, a gendered experience. And so what we kind of see here is these um, tokenistic approaches that just really aren't good enough um, and, and the kind of commercialization of perhaps of how we start to deal with gender in cities is something that we also need to kind of start to think about. So um, one of the ways that the XYX lab does this is to think about how we can encourage participation and often that looks like um, a, a kind of workshop where we engage the kind of client, if you like, or um, uh, the stakeholders of the work that we're doing with the women who will benefit from the projects that we're hoping to um, undertake. And one of the strengths and the critical part of this research is that that kind of urban designer who's always kind of reproducing their own dominant kind of um, perspective, they are completely disrupted in this environment because the person who is expert in the room in this environment is the woman or girl or gender diverse person or member of the LGBTI community, et cetera, with all those kind of intersectional aspects kind of brought out. So we really kind of shift the hierarchy in the work that we do and that particular method. I guess there are a couple of other things that are important, um, particular kinds of, kinds of interventional typologies that we're thinking about. So a lot of our work at the moment is dominated by gender sensitive lighting, thinking about how we can use technology, the co-design that we just worked towards, um, we're really working on how we can improve our solidarity with First Nations people um, and really do better in engaging in, in that aspect of our research, which is kind of the primary thing that must come before any of those other things. And um, or actually, I did just also want to say that communications, which is something that Kurt touched on, is a massive part of it, how we can use um, communication to instruct people in the public places as what is acceptable behaviour. Um, a lot of our, our most recent research project is being translated into different languages so that the communication can engage with other um, different ethnicities, et cetera. And finally, that leads to the fact that, you know, buildings won't solve this problem, uh, a particular form of landscaping won't solve this problem. We have to think about how a single initiative um, and a standalone initiative isn't ever going to be sufficient to tackle the problems around um, gender inequity in cities. And so what we're really thinking about is how we can engage a multifaceted approach, but how do we kind of um, gather a coordinated package of initiatives together? And that's, I think, the kind of key challenge for making cities that um, belong to everybody. Um, and hopefully I'm not too over time, Jonathan. Not at all. Thank you, Nikki. Um... You know, I think, you know, I, I repeat this every webinar that we have, um, you know, we, we, we there's such fast, fascinating topics and we really just get to skim the surface. 
Um, but um, you know, for everyone watching today, um, Kurt and Nikki have got um, there's a lot of material um, that they have online that goes into more depth on um, about these subjects, and I would encourage you to to go and have a look, and we, we'll share some of that um, with you all at at the end as well. Um, just before we we open up to um, the, we open up the Q and A, um, Nikki, I, I did want to ask um, if you could maybe share some of the um, the XYX lab projects that you're working on to, to help address some of the issues that you raised. Mm, sure. Um, so I think like um, Kurt, I, I've spent the last two years working in looking at public transport spaces and developing a whole range of place making toolkits and recommendations around how we, how we collect data and um, train people in public transport spaces and just to really think very carefully about women and girls perceptions of those places and I think that's a massive part of the work that we need to do in terms of access and inclusion. Um, but given that it is a Designing Geelong forum, I thought also it would be useful to say that we have just launched a project last week called Your Ground, which is a um, geolocative mapping project. It's the kind of fourth project we've done like this now, uh, looking at Victorian recreational spaces. So our parks and the ways that women and gender diverse people are using uh, their public places to really think about safety and perceptions of safety. So that's a, a way that we can um, amplify the voices of people that sometimes are not heard in the communities and cities that we live in. And then that kind of data set becomes a whole uh, raft of um, information that local councils can use to prioritise particular aspects of whether it's budget or projects. Um, and to really start to meet the, in Victoria, we have a, um, a new gender equality act which has come into play. And so there's a lot of remits around that. So we're really leveraging the fact that there's an opportunity where councils need to step up and this project will really help them. So there's 20 local council areas, uh, both in metro, out of suburbs and regional areas, who have joined forces and have partnered on that project. So it's it's um, fantastic and the launch was really successful. Geelong is one of those partners, I should say. Yep. That, that's fantastic. And um, we um, can maybe share that, uh, a link to that um, website on, on the chat as well. Um, everyone can, can go and have a look. Um, um, okay, well, I think we can open up now to um, for questions from the audience. So if you haven't already done so, um, please drop one into, uh, into the chat um, or let us know if you would like to, to ask a question to, to Kurt um, or Nikki or, or both, indeed. Um, thanks, Nikki. So the, the link is in the, in the chat for everyone now. So maybe while everyone's gathering um, their thoughts, um, I mean, obviously there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, different aspects to what both of you have just dis discussed today, um, and the challenge I think um, is is always around you know, how do we how do we do this and where do we start? And I I felt it was it was very clear in, in what both of you said that um, part of that challenge is undoing, undoing what we've learned um, through education and through, and through practice um, uh, because it, it hasn't, it, it hasn't been there before that, that knowledge, that understanding and um, those learnings and those, those different ways of, of, you know, different lenses with which to look at, at these problems, um, they, they they haven't been part of um, how we've been taught or how we've practiced. Um, I'm wondering. I mean, you, you're you're both in um, in academia, um, but also in you know in, involved in projects with um, with local government and and others as well. Um, I'm wondering if you've got some advice around how how do you um, how do you go about um, making that change um, how, you know how, wh where do you start where, where would you send someone um, to help them kind of start out on that um, on that journey well um, look it just really struck me listening to Nikki actually it just reminded me of a, another thing that I remember witnessing um, many years ago now that a, a planning practitioner called Karen Malone used to do so she was uh, somebody who worked for the Child Friendly Cities Initiative of UNICEF and was doing a lot of work around young people's inclusion in public space. 
And I remember her getting engaged um, to help out the ACT government with a kind of, you know, a child-friendly city strategy that was about rethinking how we plan public spaces with kids in mind. Um, and the first thing she did was got uh, a group of the senior planners who happened to be all uh, white blokes um, in that instance and invited them down to a youth centre. Um, and as they were, you know, they wanted to talk to young people about their experiences and had set up a nice boardroom somewhere in a planning office to do that. And Karen said, nut, 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 you're coming down to Woden um, and you're coming into the youth centre. And when they got to the front door, she got them to take their shoes and their socks off, um, take their ties off, take their jackets off and sit on the floor of a basketball court in a you know, dilapidated <laughs> and underfunded youth centre. And then asked them, the kids came in and asked them how they felt and they were feeling uncomfortable and kids said, exactly, right? <laughs> so now we can begin. Um, and what Nikki was just saying about who the experts are um, in different scenarios. And just, I think for the, you know, for all of us to have that sort of modesty of realising that other people are <laughs> experts in their experiences uh, and can tell us about their city um, and then if we're really going to engage in cities for everyone, then we, we have to be able to start by um, acknowledging and recognising everybody's expertise um, mm. as a starting point um, and then taking dialogue and negotiation from there. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think that's um, a great example. I, I, one of the things I find myself saying increasingly to um, practitioners and um, governments that we're kind of presenting to is to really notice how uh, their their sense of um, engaging with gender in particular is really kind of quite flawed. So I, I got very, very frustrated um, when I would give presentations and people, you know, people who are expert in the fields of urban design and architecture and planning would get up and say, well, you know, when I do this, I design like this because when I had a pram, or, you know, my, my gay son likes it like this, or my daughter wants it like that. We've seen this in politics really recently. So there's this kind of somehow because it's gender, you get to kind of all of a sudden be personal and you don't have to actually undertake any kind of research or make sure that it's evidence-based. And so I always really start with that as a kind of challenge. They would never do that with material research or with environmental research. And we have to start to treat it as, as, the, um, as, as a... A research area that is um, valid and needs to be, have integrity um, and I think that that's also really important is not to make assumptions about what you think people want or what you think they need based on your own personal experiences because that's incredibly problematic and that's happening all the time everywhere. Yeah so um, I think I mean this, what you take from that is um, obviously the, the importance of walking in other people's shoes um, like that, you know, the really experiential aspect of, of research that maybe is not as um, prominent in certain areas that, that, that it should be. Um, so maybe sort of more ethnographic based um, approaches to how we um, really engage with, with some of these issues would, would help um, in, in practice in, um, maybe we, we need to teach that in and um, more, more so in, in um, tertiary education as well, um, to our designers, to architects, urban designers, and, and, and so on. Okay, we, we, we've got a couple of questions. Um, and um, one is around, um, well, this is an issue that um, uh, really came up over the last sort of few, few years, uh, or, well, certainly became more prominent in the media, um, around um, statues, um, and I guess monuments that exist in public space that, um, you know, have, have got a, a history that's uh, maybe difficult for some people in, um, in, in, in the community. And, and you know, how, how do we move forward from that? And it, it, it's far from, I think it's, it's an interesting question because it's far from um, being black and white in, in terms of the, the response to that. Um, so I, mean, I think for a lot of people, the answer would be that you simply remove them. Um, but for, um, for other people, um, I've got um, some familiarity with this subject because I remember, for example, a, a friend of mine back home um, when I was living in Dublin saying, um, you know, it was very, um, I think it was very mature of, of the city to retain certain monuments um, 
and elements of the built form that um, were put in place by the British whenever they um, colonized um, Ireland um, as a recognition of, you know, that that is part of our history. Whether it's, you know, our history is not, not all good and bad, it's part of our history and retaining that was um, was a sign of maturity. Um, so I think it's 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 a it's, it's a far from black and white sort of issue, but maybe interested in your opinion about um, about those kind of aspects of the built form that are very challenging for certain um, groups in our um, communities. Oh well, yeah, it's a it's a big one to get into, isn't it? And I, I guess mm. um, like I think this is possibly um, the first step is to have a capacity to, I, I guess we have to have to make a distinction between different kinds of offense that things in an urban environment might cause. Um, and again here, um, it strikes me that the offense that might be caused to um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people by the place names, statues, other elements of the built environment that celebrate certain people who've played roles in uh, you know, uh, removing children, played roles in frontier wars, et cetera, et cetera, is a whole other order of offence to, I don't like that piece of graffiti on the street corner, right? Um, because it is about uh, a, a kind of foundational injustice in our society, which is the colonisation of this country without treaty uh, and through violent means. So I think, firstly, like being able to recognise that, you know, that kind of offence is, is, is of a particular order that might be uh, way more important than others. And then secondly, your point, Jonathan, about like what to then do and about, I think there'll be some cases where if we can accept that premise, then the dialogue that comes from there might end up being about removal or changing names. It might in some instance end up being about creating a dialogue in the environment where for instance, a statue remains, but another one is put up right next to it that, <laughs> offers some counter position or explanation and sort of dramatizes the, the conflict uh, in the built environment. And again, like informally in a funny way, this is what the tent embassy outside old parliament house in Canberra does, right? There's a nice statue of an old king um, that is still there. Um, and the tent embassy is sort of right next to it and offering a different commentary on land and country in Australia to the commentary that the statue offers. And um, yeah, so I guess there's different ways to then think about what to do with those um, conflicts as they arise, that as you say, there, there might not be one size fits all here. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. Um, Nick, Nikki. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I've got much more to add to that. I think the um, the question is about particularly about indigeneity and um, that kind of aspect. I guess the only thing that I would I kind of wrote down is that. It, there is something so important about representation in the urban urban spaces and not that I'm not comparing this at all to the question but for example I've done a whole lot of work around the representation of sexualized images and hypersexualized images of women in urban spaces and you know I think we have to think very carefully about the kinds of impacts that they have on people and the the meanings and the ways that they shape how we relate to other people and what we expect of other people and um uh, yeah, I think that there's an important piece of work and change and probably radical change that's required around those issues. Mm. Um, I've got another question. Um, this is, um, it, it's for you, Nikki. Um, uh, the question is, can you expand on the necessity to not only design the built environment to be more equitable, um, but the other factors that um, contribute to um, equitable public space and and how local government or what role local government can, can play in policy and implementation? Yeah, look, a lot of our work is not about design in the built environment. As I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, it's about how we can use design tools to think about how we can solve those social problems. And putting things in the built environment won't solve the complex issues that we're talking about today. And that they may be part of that story. We can think about particular, um, you know, Kurt mentioned um, issues around kind of how we care for maintenance and, and, and maintain spaces. Um, and, and I think those things have do have real impact. But actually, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is about behaviour of other people, about the social expectations that we have when we're in public places. And so, um, 
For example, with the public transport work we've just done, also like what Kurt said, we don't need to see more policing of these places. Actually, one of the fundamental things that change how people feel about being in public places or public transport, for women in particular, is actually just basically having more women in public places. Um, and I suspect that for uh, gender diverse people or the LGBTI community, what, make, what will make them feel safer is actually just seeing more diverse people in public places. And you could say the same for ethnicity and, and other forms of minoritization. So that's actually not a design problem, it's an activation problem and how we kind of create pol uh, yeah, policies and activities that allow for that to be increased. Um, and the other thing that I would say is that we need anybody who is in a public facing kind of role to be trained in gender sensitive practices. Um, some people would call that trauma informed practices where they are able to understand and provide an empathetic response to someone who is talking about a gendered issue or an experience that is um, uh, about their kind of minoritization in public spaces. And I don't, I don't think we're, we're anywhere close to that yet. I, I think it's interesting. We could probably have a long discussion about the, the social and the material the component. And, um, and for me, it, it, it's very relational, um, very much so. And I'm, I'm interested in and uh, I'm trying to address one of the questions that we have in the Q&A about, you know, for both of you, what, what um, you know, what aspects of the built environment um, um, have you seen in your research that is is really problematic that we we really need to address um to cctv i don't know if kurt will agree <laughs> yeah that'd be up there for top five um yeah and um i don't know um so you know even one thing i've got to be in my bonnet about at the moment um up here is silly little things like the fact that about in the last decade in Sydney, about 600 and something public schools have had 2.2 metre spear top fences put around them that has just locked up a whole bunch of public spaces that were made safe because there were people around. Um, and now we've turned around and thought about safety as lockable spear top fences. And mm. what that does to the environment inside for the kids and the teachers and what it does for the community that used to have access to that school and the playgrounds on the majority of the year, which is after school and weekends and school holidays. Um, it's diabolical. But like, again, I think there's that, um, whether it's the CCTV or those fences, like there's two examples of how we just use this kind of design to quote unquote design out crime and end up designing out the life of a public space at the same time. Yeah, we could probably have a long discussion about SEPTED um, and, and where that's got us. Um, obviously, CCTV is part of that um, discussion. Um, Kurt, you, your comments are really interesting. Um, I, I was I spent a bit of time in Copenhagen um, doing research a couple of years ago when they were undertaking a process of, um, they were taking the fences down around um, primary schools and mm -hmm. integrating the, the, the playground into the, the public realm um, to give the children more space um, during the day, but also then to provide new public spaces for the community um, in, in, in the evening. Oh, um, I'm so following you up about that. That sounds really interesting. We, we've, gone the, we've gone the other way. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left, but I, I would, um, I, I'm very aware of the issues with CCTV, but maybe some of the audience aren't. Um, Nicole, would you like to maybe just a minute or two just um, t tell us about some of those issues, why CCTV is, is a problem? I mean, I think it's a really fascinating area because by and large, the councils that we work with, what they tell us is that the general public, people in the community want to see more CCTV. Maybe that's the um, business owners. Um, certainly there's a lot of support for it, but with the research that we do and other researchers um, uh, uh, as well have kind of evidenced the ways that it's actually an incredibly um, ungender sensitive <laughs> response to trying to think about security in public places. So for women and girls, when they see those cameras, they don't make them feel safer at all. They just make them feel like they need, they're under threat and they're going to see themselves on the late night news. Um, uh, and it's kind of a forensic tool for how we might kind of resolve a problem after it's occurred. Mm. 
So um, but the same kind of goes for things like emergency buttons in our research with public transport spaces. Um, not one woman had ever used one of those emergency buttons despite being sexually harassed. Um, you know, for young women, it's probably on a daily or weekly basis. They're not going to use them because there's just a whole a range of reasons why drawing attention to that situation is not kind of what, what you want to do. So um, I think these kinds of strategies are really misled uh, and um, we need to think about how actually it's, it's, it's live surveillance, the surveillance of other people that is more important. Um, when we are deferring to CCTV camera, it needs to be monitored like at exactly that moment in time and with public transport spaces, it's not, is basically what you need to know. Or, and actually sometimes it doesn't even work, so. Yeah. Yeah, um, again, it's a, a much bigger, all of these discussions lead into a much bigger discussion that unfortunately we, 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 we can't have. But um, maybe um, just to, we, we've got about a minute left, but to, to um, I did want um, to touch on another question from, from the audience, um, which is, is about the Your Ground um, project. And um, uh, the question is around, you know, how, how, how do you bring all of that data um, together and, and what is the you know the next steps once you've you, you've done that uh, so it i mean it's a it's a spatial data set so it's very specifically um located at a very like goes down to the street corner for example so there's that kind of spatial data set there are kind of questions and survey forms but also we gather stories of people's experiences so it's actually incredibly intensive to code all that we do that manually so we're reading the stories, we code it all, and particular things emerge like hotspots and themes. Um, we, because of the way we're now doing this research, we also code for all of those internet intersectional things that I spoke about today. So we've also then got to drill down to think about age and ethnicity and people's religion and various kind of um, uh, intersectional identities. Uh, and then we feed that back to the local governments and um, some some of the local governments have asked for extended reports um, and by extension a workshop like what I showed today so then we'll really start to think about problem solving but it's a, just a massive coding operation actually mm. um, in, a, in a very uh, a human-centered way. Mm. Yeah I'm uh, really looking forward to, um, to seeing the outcomes of that work. Um, Okay, I think we're, we're just about out of time, unfortunately, it would be fantastic to, to keep the discussion going. Um, I just want to thank um, Nikki and Kurt um, again for the you know, two, two wonderful talks and presentations and, um, and the discussion. Really appreciate your time today. Um, very sorry to anyone, any other questions we didn't get to. Um, if you're interested in some of the projects that we're working on, please do have a look at the Revitalising Central Geelong um, website. We've put that link up in the chat for you. Um, we hope to see you all again um, very soon at our next webinar. It's another big, big topic. We're going to talk about density. Um, and um, yeah, and we look forward to seeing you there. So take care, everyone, and see you all next month. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you both. Take care. Bye.